free updates. Any questions? I mean, I just don't mind sharing with you guys. If you don't want to hear it, I don't care. <laughs> I'm talking anyway because that's what helps me. I've got a network of friends. I've got a university that supports me incredibly. I cannot imagine being anywhere else that would treat me better than they are right now. So I, all in all, life is good. All right. Okay, let's go ahead and get on to pediatric emergencies. Um, have you guys already talked about, like, uh, nurse maid's elbow? You know nurse maid's elbow, because I didn't worry about that. So really, I'm just looking at respiratory and cardiac emergencies on this one. So here's your lecture objectives. Um, this is kind of, this kind of gives you an idea of where I'm focusing, because I will write my questions from this lecture. So this gives you an idea of where I'm focusing, okay? Um, basically, ER, pediatric ER visits, and by pediatric we mean uh, 0 to 17, 0 to 17 and under, okay? So once you're 18, you're an adult in the, the statistics. And these, I don't really have a specific reference for where I got these number, numbers from. I did a lot of different research. Some of them broke them down differently. Accidents was broken down apart from boys' names, but now, accidents refers to trauma, motor vehicle accidents, but basically you can see over half of them are accidents or respiratory. Um, I think certain times a year, probably digestive is more increased. We see a lot of diarrhea, pediatric diarrhea in the ER because parents just don't know what to do when their kid has, you know, crap 12 times a day for three days. So, you know, they get worried about dehydration and usually fluff them up a little bit with some fluids. but. I have seen pediatric mental health emergencies. They're really, really sad. Um, so there you go. Uh, endocrine, what are we talking about there? That's exactly right. P pediatric, my niece that I showed you a picture of during Peach, she was diagnosed in an ER visit. So there you go. Um, basically, 25 million patient visits a year. Um, often, and this is kind of a sad statistic, it's inversely related to wealth, so the less wealthy a family is, the more likely they are to utilize the emergency room. Um, that's truer than it used to be. I mean, that's more true these days than it used to be. I think that um, with the state of health care today, a lot of folks just don't know what to do. Urgent cares, you know, can charge a copay. Um, ERs can't, so, you know, a lot of times stuff... A lot of times ERs are filled up with urgent care type stuff. That's why so many ERs are creating a, a fast track. Um, Duncan does not have a fast track. They have me. So, you know, but I, yeah, it's fine. But you can see here on the, on the bar, you can see here on the bar that the Medicaid um, is the principal payer for over 50% of uh, pediatric ER visits. I used to work in the ER in Purcell. I think I've told you guys that a gazillion times. Um, I actually uh, was there on a rotation with Julie Bryant. Hey, do you know where she is these days? She was in, she should have been in your class, maybe a class ahead of you. But anyway, I should find her and see where she is because she was a great preceptor. I spent two months with her at the Purcell ER um, and got to know everybody really well. And there's a, who is a current preceptor, Tanya Shandy, who I also uh, precepted with down at Purcell. Um, if one of her sooner care patients came into the ER, I would triage them, and if they weren't an emergency, I sent them to Tanya's. I would call Tanya's office and say, "Did Blotty Blah call for an appointment today?" And if they said no, I triaged them and sent them to her office as a work-in. So that was one way to kind of. I mean, and technically that's perfectly legit, you know. So not an that, that's right. That's right. It's not an MTOL. So. Um, that was one way that Purcell helped uh, keep their doors open. Okay, the most important thing in a pediatric emergency is to remain calm because often the parents are freaking out, the kid is most likely freaking out if it is a true emergency, but just to remain calm. It's kind of funny, but, and, you know, I don't know where this came from, but the more freaked out people around me get, the calmer I get. So, you know, I'm the one, and, and, you know, sometimes it's perceived, especially by my children, mm -hmm. as just not giving a flip, but mm -hmm. it's not mm -hmm. that. It's the, right, right, that's right. You just stay calm. I mean, like, mom, the mom comes running straight past the ER nurse, because we don't have a 
a buzzer door or anything in Duncan, straight past the ER triage nurse carrying her kid that the lawnmower just cut off that part of his, that part of his fingers. You know, and so, you know, I'm the one, and the ER doc, I'm sitting right next to the ER doc, and I said, I got this. <laughs> so, yeah, so I got to jump up and go, you know, do every, and it was just, the mom was just like, oh my God, you're so calm, thank you, thank you. Because she was freaking out, but you know, we get a, you know, get a couple of three milligrams of morphine, and the kid, he's fine, you know, they're all good. <laughs> anyway, we ended up sending them to Children's to a hand surgeon, but I, there wasn't, she was like, should I send somebody to look for his fingertips? I'm like, yeah, I don't know that I bother. You know, so, but you, what do you do if you do find um, a severed appendage? I find it And? Milk. Have you heard that? Milk. Milk, something about the proteins, the, the proteins in milk. Well, the ice and milk. So. But then our dental doctor, um, and he very minimally said uh, digits too, but I don't know if you guys caught that. That's exactly right. A, a severed digit, yeah, ice and milk, and that'll, that can usually save it. And it, well, I don't know that it'll save it depending on the surgeon. You know, it'll either, you know, they'll either be able to work with it or not, but at least you've given somebody an option. Okay. He also said they could put their own tooth in their mouth as long as they were old enough not to swallow it. Don't have them put the digit Sorry. in their mouth. <laughs> <laughs> that would be kind of hilarious. <laughs> yeah, lawnmowers are scary, scary things. Um, I knew a friend of mine before I was in medicine who used to let her boy well, she was the worst, I mean, she was the worst helicopter parent before that term was even invented. I mean, she would literally, I had like stools at a bar, you know, at an island bar in my kitchen in Connecticut, and she would stand behind him like this the entire time he was on a stool. And I realized it's because when he was 18 months, she let him ride on their riding lawnmower with him, hit a bump, he flipped off and totally like, Totally messed that kid up, his leg. I mean, he'll lump for the rest of his life. But anyway, so, you know, some things, you know, there's some things that are accidents and some things that are just almost going to happen. Do you know what I mean? They're not really an accident. They're going to happen. If you let your 18-month-old ride on the lawn, riding lawnmower with you, unless they're wearing a Kevlar suit, something's going to happen. All right, so basically pediatric emergencies for, in this lecture come in three primary forms, respiratory shock and cardiac emergencies. Um, respiratory emergencies can present as upper airway um, obstructions, lower airway obstructions, lung parenchymal diseases, and disorders of controlled breathing. Okay? So let's take a look at this picture right here. What is being done correctly in this picture? Uh -huh. Covering his nose and mouth. Uh huh. Uh huh. What else? What else is being done correctly in this picture? She seems calm. She seems calm. That's exact. Hey, that's true. I mean, kids pick up on it. I mean, they do. They seriously pick up on it. Is what else? Letting him hold it. That's exactly of... right. Let him hold it. Let him do. And another thing that I think is being done correctly that is kind of subtle. Nobody try to put this kid in a gown. A lot of times, kids freak out when you want to take their clothes off and put them in a gown. So there's no reason to do that if it's going to agitate. Obviously, this kid is having some kind of respiratory issue, and when you agitate a kid with a respiratory issue, it often exacerbates that issue. So this is being done correctly. Also, she's very calm. She kind of looks like the kid, and you know, I mean, you can't look like all your patients, but if you've got a very timid, you know, little blonde-haired, blue-eyed girl, and you've got some big, burly, you know, big-voiced with a full beard, you know, I mean, she's probably going to be scared just by looking at it. So, I mean, we've got our friend Crazy Dave, you know, that we would let babysit when we absolutely cared our least. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I'll bring you guys the first thing that I noticed that I Sometimes, and even like your very uh, disciplined parents will like lay them in the bed and hold them down. You gotta be still, you gotta take this. Well, 
one, you're agitating them, and, and two, your airways will work better when you're upright. Yeah, that's why tripoding is a thing yeah. for respiratory. So, um, yeah, I'll bring you guys a picture of Crazy Dave one of these times. Did you with your kids when they were little? <laughs> Did what? Did you have your kids when they were little? Um, actually, yeah. My husband, when he would, you know, Paul didn't really work until everybody, he never worked at the same time I did until like our youngest was like uh, maybe 12, 13, 14, like that. And sometimes he'd get tied up and couldn't pick the kids up um, in time for, um, so what he did, well, he went home and swapped out his work van. We had this, um, because we're the Logatois. We found this school bus, this old Chevy full-size van that had been converted to a school bus. They'd taken out the front passenger seat, they put one of those swing-out arm things on the front passenger door, they welded the slider door shut, they replaced all the windows with literally up and down school bus windows. And the best part, there were uh, four rows with the center aisle, black, you know that black with the green fleck like every school bus had for a floor? That was the floor. And there was like these green school bus seats. Straight up and down, two kids per seat, and seat belts. So we could literally haul 17 kids. So, yeah, two rows, yeah, two, four rows of, uh, um, four rows of four, 16 kids plus the driver, 17 kids. When I was in PA school, we did a fundraiser, one of our class fundraisers was, we went down to the Lloyd Noble and cleaned up after a concert. You could sign up to do that and they would pay your group. Yeah, we took everybody down in the school bus, Paul drove, it was great, it was, fun. It was a lot of fun. Anyway, so Paul would call Dave and Dave had a key to the bus and Crazy Dave would, um, pull up to the school, and the school bus, and he'd throw the door open and go, hey, hey, little girl, come get in. <laughs> and the kids and the teachers were like, um, are you sure you want to go there? And they're like, oh, that's just crazy Dave. <laughs> but he also drove like a rat bike. Do you know what a rat bike is? Okay, a rat bike is um, where you take a motorcycle and you just don't give a crap about it. You know, you just do whatever you can to it. So it was this motorcycle, and the rear fender had been pulled off, so Dave got, I don't know how he did it, but he got like the, the side of a telephone booth, you know, with like where it had like the outline of the old school phone, you know, and the dots, you know, on the, and he bent it between two tree stumps, and that was his fender. Anyway, so he, picked, he would pick up Cass, um, our oldest, on the rat bike. And that was great too. <laughs> like on the last day of school on her birthday, it was a special occasion to get to ride the rat bike. <laughs> All right, so let's move on. So respiratory distress can present as forms of respiratory distress. Tachypnea, increased respiratory effort, which looks to you like nasal re nasal flaring and retractions. We've talked about retractions. You know what that is, where you see the outline of the ribs as they in uh, inspire. Inadequate respiratory effort, like hypoventilation, you know, they're not breathing, they're just breathing too slow. Um, abnormal breath sounds, strider wheezing, grunting, tachycardia, pale and cool skin, um, and changes in level of consciousness. That one, I'm not so sure, I wouldn't put that one into more of a respiratory failure, but that can definitely be a sign or a symptom of respiratory distress. As opposed to signs and symptoms of respiratory failure, Marked um, tachypnea, which is a sign of early, the slow breathing is a sign of late respiratory failure. Increased, decreased, or no respiratory effort, I would definitely call that respiratory failure. Um, poor to absent distal air movement, uh, tachycardia early, bradycardia late, uh, cyanosis, and stupor or coma, that's also late. General management for all <laughs> levels of respiratory distress, Airway positioning, the head, uh, head tilt and the chin lift, um, oxygen supplementation, whether it's nasal cannula. I, ha I worked with one doc that every time he put nasal cannula on a kid, he cut the prongs off. Because number one, the prongs are huge. And number two, they really don't do anything but irritate the kids. So cut the prongs off and, and you can still get the, the oxygen right in the kid's nose. Um, Always, uh, if you have to, I mean, if you if you can't get a mask on the kid, you can, um, you know, you've got your tubing and you just tape it together and you give them flow by and lay it on the bed with them. Um, pulse, pulse oximetry, you want IV or IO access and you want to monitor them. 
cardiac monitoring, and then uh, the BLS is indicated. Okay. Any questions about anything thus far? Does this feel a lot like review? You guys must be in like the 11th month of your didactic year. This is great. This is great, right? All right. So, common upper airway obstructions, croup and RSV. We talked about this in PEDS, I believe. We talked about croup and RSV. You can hear that um, walking through. You can hear that kid in the lobby from the back. You know. Um, so treatments there, we're going to do racemic epi, which really, um, there's no studies that say it improves, but it does. So if it's not going to hurt them, why not? Dexamethasone um, and humidified air, um, that's why stepping out in the night with the kids will help with the croupy cough. RSV, um, also there's no, uh, there's no, um, evidence that bronchodilators help, but they don't hurt, so we still use them in RSV treatment. Anaphylaxis, um, IM epinephrine, albuterol, and histamines like Benadryl and Zantac, and then when they're, when a, uh, uh, Zyrtec and Zantac is my mantra, so, but uh, diphenhydramine is faster acting, uh, methylprednisolone, um, and also another form of an upper airway obstruction is aspiration of a foreign body. And we've talked about that quite a bit. Does anybody have any questions about that? Or is a foreign body most likely to settle in a PEDS patient? Yeah, there you go. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's the Depends on the state, depends on the severity of the crew. A lot of times you can just do three days of uh, uh, oral, you know, or if they're inpatient, you're going to do an IV. So make sure that you're doing the milligram to kilogram and tapering that. Mm -hmm. And steroids make children um, monsters. Monsters. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, just saying. So I, when I were, to your parents, expectations are extremely important with kids. Exactly. Educating your parents saves you a lot of time. Um, just from a clinic point of view, the more you educate your parents, the less time you spend um, on the phone with your answering mm -hmm. service, quite frankly. So, you know, educating your parents that, you know, this stuff tastes nasty, nasty, nasty. If you can hit them with, I think I've told you this trick, hit them with a shot of chocolate syrup, mm -hmm. shot of steroids, shot of chocolate syrup. I don't know what Dr. Latassi might say about that, but. She <laughs> 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 chocolate 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 I Actually, I told her that, so. I, mean, <laughs> I, she, she, I guarantee you, if she proved it, she did some kind of research <laughs> and found something to support it, so. That's always not, I feel so affirmed right now. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, the chocolate chaser's amazing. Um, but always warn the parents, this will make your kids hungry and angry. So keep lots of healthy snacks around, and that's what I should have done for Paul, because he's put on 30 pounds since he started on his dexamethasone, but we're not talking about that. And um, anyway, so, uh, but yeah, just warn the parents to keep healthy stuff around, okay? All right, let's move on. Um, upper airway uh, obstruction signs and symptoms. Increased respiratory effort, strider, and you guys all know what strider sounds like. Uh, barking cough and hoarseness. Uh, they can also have tachycardia, pallor, cool skin early, cyanosis late, anxiety and agitation early, lethargy and unresponsiveness late, and variable temp, depending on the cause, okay? Any questions? Ruby? Mm -hmm. uh, lower airway obstructions include bronchiolitis and RSV again. And I kind of wondered when I, you know, I mean, RSV can be upper or lower. It's just increased uh, goo in the lungs. Um, a lot of times the nasal suctioning can help um, when the kids come in and they're all snotted up, nasal suctioning. Uh, the uh, Frida, you guys, that one, yeah, yeah. Gross, but it works. Okay. Bronchodilators also. Um, lower airway obstruction, asthma is defined as a lower airway obstruction. With that, you're going to do the albuterol with or without the ipratropium. Okay, so that's do an M. Uh, corticosteroids, sub Q epinephrine can work with asthma. Um, max sulfate, terbutaline, and humidified air. Okay, any questions about any of that? You notice I'm not giving you doses. We'll talk about that in uh, the next presentation. 
Lower airway signs and symptoms. Of course, we're going to have increased respiratory effort, um, expiratory wheezing, prolonged respiratory phase, or I'm sorry, prolonged expiratory phase. Uh, tachycardia, here's the same thing again. Pallor, cool skin early, cyanosis late, anxiety agitation early, lethargy unresponsiveness late, and variable temperatures. So lung parenchymal diseases such as pneumonia and pneumonitis, it can be caused by infectious, it can be a chemical reaction, an inhaled chemical reaction, also be an aspiration, okay? I, I know I've told you guys about the kid and the five peanuts. Right? Have I told you guys about the kid in the five peanuts? I think I've seen them back. Yeah, yeah. Bronco, this kid just kept having repeated, repeated, right? No, it wasn't. Was it the right? No, I don't remember. He just kept having repeated infection. You know, I mean, we get it cleared up on antibiotics. Two weeks later, he'd be back in with the same thing. Finally sent him over to uh, James Royal over at uh, Children's Hospital, did a, a bronchoscopy on him and pulled out five peanuts. Mm -hmm. And this mom was an awesome mom, but she, he, was, he was like the youngest of four kids, and the sibling was just, you know, you teach your kids to share, right? <laughs> you know, he gave the 12-month-old the, uh, peanuts. Mm -hmm. Oops. Um, uh, pulmonary adhesive. Huh? Good thing he wasn't allergic. Right. <laughs> Actually, have you heard the latest theories on all the kids and allergies? Mm -hmm. Expose them early. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, which kind of makes sense to me. Oh, it tends to spread past while you're pregnant. Right? <laughs> do they still do the peanuts and the peanut shells on the floor? <laughs> there used to bar, be a bar in Oklahoma City that did that. You could go in and eat peanuts. and I mean, it was they were just like... That's what my kids call the peanut place. The peanut place. That's hilarious. <laughs> but then, um, can I tell you about my, my granddaughter and uh, rhubarb? Okay, so my granddaughter <laughs> is anaphylactic to rhubarb. Okay. I guess it's a it's a Yankee thing because they do rhubarb out the wazoo everything rhubarb everything. So my kid or my daughter-in-law, whom I love dearly and loves my son, so I love her even more. Um, you gotta pass them off to somebody, right? Anyway, so uh, she sends like the third week of kindergarten sends um, Izzy to school with a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And oh my God, the like the mom, the you know the, the the parent association mafia came down on her. Oh my God, you cannot send peanuts to school. Blah 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 blah. And she goes, why? I mean, and, oh man, she had to shut her Facebook down. She started such a ruckus about this. She goes, why? I mean, I don't get it. My kid's not allergic to peanuts, you know. I mean, so anyway, so they have this whole school-wide policy: no peanuts in the elementary school. Well, Izzy's anaphylactic to rhubarb, and somebody sent rhubarb bars or rhubarb cookies or something for the class treat. Now, Izzy is smart enough not to eat one, as opposed to those other idiots and the kids with the peanut allergies. <laughs> don't say, oh, by the way, don't eat the peanut butter sandwich your friend's having for lunch. <laughs> anyway, so, anyway, so um, Jackie went to, you know, and was like, um, I don't get it. If we're going to be super cautious about peanuts, we need to be super cautious about everything, or we need to just educate our children, you know, one of the two. So how do you guys feel about that situation? Uh -huh. Educate your children. Mm -hmm. I've got a niece, oh, actually she's my great niece, that is Bang. anaphylactic to Bang. peanuts, yes. coconut, I mean that kid, bless her, bless her heart. And she's now like 10 and she knows to ask what's in this, what's in this, can, you know. And I think, I think that they're handling that right, you know, but that kid's wound up in the ER more times than, I mean that kid, she's the kid you prescribe four EpiPens for, you know. Okay, so I got off on something. Didn't I? <laughs> All right, pulmonary edema. Okay, so pulmonary edema would be considered a lung parenchymal disease. Um, pulmonary, pulmonary edema can have a cardiac origin, such as you know uh, congestive heart failure when you've got like a congenital heart defect. It can also have a non-cardiac <coughs> origin with acute respiratory distress syndrome. Consider non-invasive or invasive ventilator support with positive or with um, PEEP, which is positive end expiratory pressure. So, what does that mean? Does, has anybody thought that through? Do you guys remember from pulmonology? What does PEEP do? 
it keeps your keeps alveoli. alveoli. That's exactly right. It doesn't allow for the natural collapse of the alveoli on expiration because when they're having that, and if you think about it, it makes sense. They're having that pulmonary edema pushing on the outside of the alveoli. So if it collapses, it's going to, it might be hard for it to re-expand and re-inflate. So that's why the PEEP works good for that. Um, consider vasoactive support and consider a diuretic just to kind of pull off those fluids. Okay. Um, signs and symptoms of lung parenchymal disease, uh, diseases. Increased respiratory effort, grunting and crackles. What is grunting? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I know it's <laughs> I mean, what is a respiratory grunt? They like grunt when they breathe in and out, right? Like they strain yeah. so hard as they're... <laughs> yeah. Like that, okay? If you ever hear a baby grunting, in fact, just go... You guys are cracking me up. You guys. <laughs> That's bad. Bad. Yeah, I mean it's bad. It's scary. It's scary. You'll you'll know it. Go home or uh, Google or some of you guys are probably doing it right now. Um, look up or YouTube respiratory grunting, and it's it's a scary situation. Um, and decreased breath sounds. They just don't you don't hear their breath in their lower uh, their lower lobes. Nope, they're not moving. <coughs> Sorry, I think I have something I'm kind of. Smells funny in here. What's it smell like? Peppermint. Huh? Peppermint. <laughs> peppermint. What is up with the peppermint? <laughs> Holy cow! Maybe I'm anaphylactic here. People. This might be my own personal. <laughs> I'm serious. It's like, oh. Okay. okay. They were from personal sensei. Just went off. What do you What do you do with the peppermint over there? Just snort it or what? <laughs> huh? It kind of wakes me up a little bit. God, I'll say, I can't freaking breathe. Uh, that's another thing. When you work in a, if you work peds or if you work the ER, please leave everything smelly at home. So, I'm, I mean, Taylor, I'm not picking yeah, on you. Right. I'm, I'm not. But seriously, if you work peds or you work the emergency room, no perfumes, don't do smell, extra smelly stuff in your hair. You know, you really got to be... <laughs> respectful of your patients. Um, uh, so advanced lung parenchymal signs and symptoms, the same old, same old tachycardia, pallor, cool skin early, cyanosis late, anxiety, agitation early, lethargy and responsiveness late, and variable temperatures. All right, disordered control of breathing. Now what does that mean? What does that mean? Like their brain's not regulating them. Something, something's going on to inhibit the normal neuro pathways that cause your diaphragm. What happens when you inhale? Your diaphragm contracts. That's exactly right. Your diaphragmatic, your diaphragm muscle contracts, which increases negative pressure in your lungs, which brings air in. Okay. And then as you exhale, your diaphragm relaxes. Okay, so and which causes it to go back up into the, the domed bell, okay, the bell shaped thing, right? So that's why if you breathe like you should breathe, your belly goes out. But most, especially females, are taught not to breathe like that. So a lot of times we don't breathe right anyway, you know, until you get to be my age, then you don't get the, you don't get the right. But anyway, so, but seriously, I mean, it's something to think about. If a kid is really having trouble breathing their, their belly. They have a lot of exaggerated belly movements, okay? So when it's a disordered control of breathing, perhaps there's something, it can come from a lot of things. Increased intracranial pressure can, can inhibit the neural pathways. That can ca come from trauma or abuse, meningitis or encephalitis, a tumor, or a brain bleed. Okay, um, poisoning. So when, just because they've got, uh, you see a breathing issue, if it's disordered control of breathing, <coughs> then you need to think something other than just respiratory. Does that make sense? That's what we're getting at here. Um, a poisoning or an overdose, uh, especially opioids or calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, crack, and TCA. I mean, I even hate to have to say crack, but you know, um, it's, it's out there and it's for real. Uh, neuromuscular disease, um, epilepsy, cerebral palsy, and a brain injury can also cause that, okay? 
Any questions about this broad topic? Shock is something that I wanted to talk about. We have four main types of shock, hypovolemic, distributive shock, obstructive shock, and cardiogenic shock. Causes of the hypovolemic shock can be either non-hemorrhagic or hemorrhagic. Distributive shock can be, now what is distributive shock? Body-wide. Hmm? Body-wide. Yeah, you're right. Your fluids are just not where they're supposed to be. Septic, anaphylactic, and neurogenic are the main causes of that. Cardiogenic shock can cause from, can come from bradyarrhythmias, uh, tachyarrhythmias, congestive heart disease, myocarditis, cardiomyopathies, and poisonings, okay? Such as the calcium channel blocker. Obstetric shock, uh, I'm sorry, obst obstetric shock. <laughs> I mean, funny. Obst obstructive shock from ductal dependent, tension pneumo, cardiac tamponade, and pulmonary embolism. Does all of that make sense to you? You guys are really, you guys are really getting good at this. I mean, this is why we don't do emergency medicine first. Right? Okay. And you can have a combination of more than one type of shock. That's exactly right. Sorry, guys. You can have comorbidities. You can have a combination. So like your cardiogenic shock from endocarditis uh, or cardiomyopathy could end up being septic as well. So then you've got both yep. cardiogenic and distributed. Yep. Whole picture. Um, it's not, a, a lot of times, it's not zebra hunting, but it's looking for the whole herd of elf, herd of horses. Horses are in a herd? No. What are they called? Cows are in a herd. What are horses? Flock? No. 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 It's a herd. I think it's They're a herd. Yeah. Is it a herd of horses? Yeah. For some reason, that doesn't sound right. Huh? We'll ask Mr. Google. Somebody's asking the Google. Yeah. Did you, hey, did you guys get my email about the, uh, the two um, possible Dumaflegis scholarships? Anybody interested in Anybody interested in that? Yeah, I don't know. You know, here's the thing. I, you know, some people might know they want to go into PA education, but quite frankly, I'm kind of in the mindset that you need to practice a while. So I'm not too sure about this whole student track, but for somebody that knows they're going to wind up there eventually, to get familiar with the organization, often you know at the beginning might help because I didn't even know what the PAEA was till two years ago. Yeah, exactly three years ago. So there you go. Um, and also I said at that military um, thing, uh, anybody interested in that? I tried it. Did you? Good for you. Good for you. Um, they'll pay you while you're going to school. They'll, um, but and then most of the time it's just a three-year commitment afterwards. So one that's of our great. graduates uh, is in that program. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, oh, I but she can, she honest. had an Air Force background before she even came to PA school. Right. Yeah. So she had a. Uh, but I think there. Um, I went to that health careers fair up at UCO in Edmond. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, the military was all over us, so that was kind of that was kind of cool. I'm not a military person. My family was a military family, but some some folks are. So, all right. So shock resuscitation. What are we looking at? Um, we need oxygen. We need Sats. We need to try to keep them between 94 and 95 percent. We need to monitor cardio uh, EKG. <coughs> We need IV IO access. Here is 20 mils per kilogram normal saline or uh, lactator ringers IV bolus over 5 to 20 minutes. Uh, you only want to do 10 mils per kilogram in cardiomyopathy and 5 milligrams per kilogram of calcium channel or beta blockers overdose. Okay? 20 mils per kilo is generally what we give, not in 5 to 20 minutes. But any febrile kid that comes into our ER, we're going to start an IV. <coughs> uh, unless it's, I mean, I don't, I try to not do that all the time. But if they've got a high fever, they've had a fever for three days, probably going to start an IV on and give them a 20, 20 mil per kilo bolus, but not over 20 minutes. We don't need to do it that fast. So, but that's just a good rule of thumb for pediatric patients. Uh, BLS is indicated, bedside glucose monitoring, and specific therapies based on the cause of the shock. Okay, any questions? Awesome.
Cardiac issues can present as V-fib, V-tac, bradycardia, SVT, PA, and asystole. Are these all becoming really familiar words to all of you? Hmm, you must have ACLS this weekend. All right, and that's the end of that one. I've got just a really 